We all sin, and when we feel contrite about it, that's progress. Here's Pastor Gary Clark. Someone that's involved in sin in their life, they know it. If they desire to walk with the Lord, believe me, they know it. If their desire is to be more Christ-like, there's no one more frustrated than they are when they fall into a sinful habit or sinful predicament. We call it sometimes an addiction. There's no one more frustrated than the addict when their desire is to be Christ-like, yet they keep stumbling. So what do we do? We encourage them. We love on them. We keep bringing them along, right? We don't just discard them so the lions eat them up. We say, now, come on, let's go. in a remarkably relevant way, addressing today's issues with real answers. Hello and welcome to A Moment of Truth with Pastor Gary Clark of Calvary Chapel, Gloucester County. On today's broadcast, we begin a study in the book of Romans, a book that offers hope and promise and answers to just about every kind of issue or question you might face. God has used this wonderful book to affect the lives of millions sparking some of the greatest revivals in the history of the church. Turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 1, and that's where we join Gary now. What a wonderful, wonderful letter that Paul has given to us in the the Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Why did the early church fathers, who, by the way, love this book, you read the early church fathers, they all talk about it. You know, they all talk about, in fact, some of them insist on having it read to them uh, twice, uh, twice, two, three times a week. They would have it read to them as they were just going about their tasks as how much they love the book of Romans because it's so rich and full of the doctrines and the and the thoughts. And here you have here you have the original ISIS member, right? Uh, You had Paul Saul at that time, uh, an original terrorist against the church. And yet you see him in this glorious conversion that comes about him, um, you know, brought on him by Jesus, by the spirit. And here you have Saul who completely changes on the road to Damascus. And um, the early church fathers just loved to see how Paul then would take all that was going on and, and, and put it into this wonderful book that is so rich. Um, we learned so much about justification. Justification is our position is what it is. Do you realize that if you are in Christ, you have a position now in Christ. You're, you are in heaven. In fact, Ephesians, he would say you're seated already in the heavenlies. So your position secure. He's going to talk about sanctification. Sanctification is the process. This is the one that frustrates us. Justification doesn't frustrate us nearly as much as sanctification. Justification, um, is our position secure? We go, okay, great. It's the sanctification. This is the one that frustrates us because we'll see people that aren't nearly as sanctified as we are. You know, understand what I'm saying? Like, you know, brother, you need to be a little more sanctified. But the good news is this. The bad news, bad news, good news. Bad news is you're not the Holy Spirit. So stop trying to be the Holy Spirit. You get frustrated because you want someone to be this far along. You want someone to be, you want someone to, to, to be a little more righteous and you're going to help them become more righteous. Well, that's you working a work that you're, it's impossible. You can guilt someone into it. Moms. <laughs> yeah, my mom left. Exactly. That's why I can say that in this. Thank you, Gene, so much. Um, yeah, spouses, we love to guilt, right? We'll guilt them into something and someone will, someone will do something for you for a little while, but eventually they just kind of collapse if they're doing it for you. But when the Holy Spirit does the work, that's the lasting work because there's power. It's not guilt. It's power is what it is. So he goes about the sanctification process that we're, that we're being cleansed. This is why some people, the day they get saved, man, they don't smoke, chew. They don't do anything. You know, they're just, they're just walking with the Lord. They love the Bible. They love to pray. They love, you know, the cursing, all the other stuff is gone, man. Just boom. Other people, it takes a little more blankety blank time. That was just for effect is all that was. You see, you got you to understand that it's not a work that we're doing. It's a work that he's doing. He's going to present us faultless, right? I'm his good work. I'm his poema. I'm his 
masterpiece. And he's the one doing the work on me. And this is why we can't look at each other and point fingers and and gripe and complain about someone who is involved in the process. The greatest thing you can do is give them more patience and more time and more encouragement and love on them. Because let me tell you, someone that's involved in sin in their life, they know it. If if they desire to walk with the Lord, believe me, they know it. If their desire is to be more Christ-like, there's no one more frustrated than they are when they fall into a sinful habit or a sinful uh, predicament. We call it sometimes, we we call these things, um, you know, uh, an addiction There's no one more frustrated than the addict when their desire is to be Christ-like, yet they keep stumbling. So what do we do? We encourage them. We love on them. We keep bringing them along, right? We don't just discard them so the lions eat them up. We say, now, come on, let's go. I watched this great video the other day of this this, um, gazelle that was trying to get across this water, and this big old nasty Nile crocodile came up and got a hold of it. Crunch. Oh, that's fast food, man. That's, that's hungry, you know. But no, this bi- out of nowhere, honestly, out of nowhere, this big muddy thing of water. All of a sudden, you see this like V, and it looks like a cruise missile underwater, just like cruising along. And out of the water comes this big monstrous hippo. This monstrous hippo comes up and grabs that crocodile, and goes crunch, and grabs the hold of the crocodile and starts shaking. Well, you can imagine the crocodile let go of the, the gazelle, and it scampers out. <laughs> You know what I mean? And it's gone on the bank and it's up the side and it's, it's done. It's gone. You don't have to awe it. It survived, all right? It lived. I was hoping for a different ending, but you know, it made it. But anyway, it was really cool because I kept thinking, you know, like we, we tend to be like those animals, right? We all back off. Someone's falling, someone's hurt, someone's injured, and we just back away from them. Oh, don't get near that guy. He's injured. You know? When the reality is that's right when we should come in, Right? We should be around them. We should surround them. That's what we need to do. So Paul's going to deal with a lot of these issues. Now, I know Buzzy went through all this with you as far as the intro to the book, as far as the uh, why Paul wrote it and where Paul wrote it from Corinth and, uh, of course, Greece right there. And he's writing to the Romans. He's writing from a position of a place where the church is is looked at as as a powerful, gleaming sort of from the outside. But you and I know the, the church in Corinth was anything but that. I mean, you had sexual immorality. It was rampant. Does that sound familiar? You have... You have a, a place where they were, they were looking at celebrity status because they were exercising sign gifts and those things. Like, you guys don't speak in tongues. Sorry, you can't be part of the elite club here. Does that sound familiar? Just turn on certain TV channels, big puffy hair, big smiles, and you see elite people. And, you know, no, nah, see, Paul's writing from a place in the church in Corinth to this church that's in Rome. And we're watching this church in Rome and um, we're seeing some neat things. We'll be introduced as we go through the book of Romans to some different people that are, that are there. Fascinating stories, Priscilla, Aquila, what a fascinating story we have with them. Phoebe, who ends up delivering the letter. What a fascinating person. We'll see these different people throughout. So you're going to be introduced to people as we go through the book of Romans. But I know Buzzy did a great job in just getting you prepped and ready for this. So we get to sort of just jump right in. Probably written 57, 58, um, there about AD. Um, and uh, Paul's writing is put in this position in the canon. The early church fathers put it there because they felt, as I think many people feel, this is his cornerstone. This is, this is what Paul would build upon, right? The book of Romans. It's such a powerful book. A lot of misunderstood things in there, and we'll kind of work through those things also. You know, some people just use it as a treatise to, to defend a position theologically on something. Well, we just want to read it in the way the Spirit would lead us into it. And uh, it's not about taking drastic positions on stuff. It's simply ab- about allowing God to speak to our hearts through what he wants to teach us. In this first chapter, there's some really cool things that we're going to talk about. Let's get right there and start. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Literally in the Greek, the way this book starts is polos doulos. If I say polos doulos, what I'm saying to you is Paul, a slave. I'm Paul and I'm a slave. This letter is being written to whom? Rome. In Rome, the church in Rome, right? One thing we know about the Romans in their empire at one time, there was probably 60 million slaves. 
They, they didn't think highly. People in Rome did not think slaves were subservient, right? That's what a slave is. So the people in Rome would not think highly of a slave. So you can imagine the bucket of cold water Paul is splashing on them when they open up the letter and it says, I'm Paul and I'm a slave. That's exactly what I am. I'm a slave. What I love about it is, you see, Paul understands this principle and you and I have to understand a principle. It's not a matter of searching for your freedom. So many people are trying to search for their freedom. I want my freedom. I want my freedom. I want my freedom. Mankind is never going to achieve their freedom. What mankind has to come to resolution with is this. Who will I be mastered by? Who is it that I'm submitting myself under? You're going to be mastered by something or someone. Now, you may think it's you, and you may do everything you can to make it you, but you're going to end up a miserable wreck because you in control of your life is a disaster. Obviously, we don't want the enemy. He's a cruel taskmaster. He makes sport of you. He mocks you. He wants to destroy you. So who wants to serve under that kind of guy? But eventually, and some of you in this room still need to understand this, you're going to find yourself submitting yourself under the one who loves you because he knows you and created you. And he knows what makes you tick. And he knows what it is that you need. And he knows where you're deficient. And he knows exactly what you need. You see, being the master of, uh, being mastered by sin is no good either. It may bring you pleasure for a little while. And you may think, this is great. I'm, I'm having the time of my life only to find out that you're going to be destroyed by the very thing that you thought was bringing you so much joy and pleasure and fun and whatever is now destroying you. Ever been there? Anybody, anybody amen that one? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we know what it is to be mastered by something only to watch it destroy us, thinking it was going to bring us so much good and joy and pleasure to find out its destruction is all it is. So Paul is saying to you, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Literally, I'm the one who will go up to that doorpost and put my ear against it so my master can pop. You see, for six years, the Old Testament, the slave, for six years, you just went along as a slave. The seventh year, you could be released or you could decide and say, no, I want to stay on with my master. I respect my master. I love my master. He's been great to me. I want to stay on. So what would you do? They would do this ceremony where they would take an awl, pop, put it in your ear, your right ear, pop it through, and then, and then uh, you're pierced. In the scripture, it talks about in the Old Testament, David would write about it. Uh, in a couple other spots, it talks about my, my ear was opened. I was pierced to show what my, I, I am will, willingly going along with my master is what I'm doing. See, that's exactly what you and I have to decide. Am I willing to commit to this thing in that way? I'm not, I don't want to just be, I don't want to just be a casual observer. I, I, I want to be committed. I want to be committed. And what is the action in your life that shows you're committed to the call of Christ? What, what is the action in your life that demonstrates, you know what, Jesus, I am willing to follow you and to surrender to you. I'm willing to lay my ear on that doorpost and to, and to be pierced to demonstrate that I am truly following you. You see, I, look, Speaking it is good, and we're going to talk a little bit about speaking it, but boy, what is the action that's going on in your life that's demonstrating that also? But anyway, he says, not only, not only am I a bondservant, but I am, called, I am called to be an apostle. I love it. Paul, whenever Paul talks about his, his uh, credentials and he talks about um, his apostolos, his being an apostle, apostle simply means uh, um, um, I have been sent out with a specific message. I have a specific message and I'm being sent out by an authority to carry this message. That's the idea of an apostle. There are some religious corners and places today that try to make more of apostleship and they try to make it something like this great hierarchy. Whenever someone tries to make a a big deal of hierarchy in the church, I don't care if it's Catholic, if it's Protestant, I don't care what it is. When someone is trying to make much of their position in a church, well, I'm, excuse me, I'm reverend so-and-so, you know, um, I'm father, so-and-so. Scripture says, call no man father. It's not about hierarchy. And when you see someone who's pushing the idea of hierarchy, guess what? That's not where you want to be. That's not what's biblical about Christianity. It's not about hierarchy. They may look good. Some of them, man, they dress like, wow, look at that guy. But whenever somebody makes much of those things, you kind of go, ah, we don't need that. That's what the scripture teaches us. We don't need that. 
See, the apostleship was the idea I'm being sent out with a specific message. Paul's message, and he's going to tell us right here, is I have been separated unto the gospel, to the good news. I am separated unto the gospel of God. Now, it's interesting, the little play here. Does anyone, does anyone want to take a venture or a guess on the idea of Pharisee and what Pharisee means? The idea of Pharisee is the idea of being separated. It's a separated one. Now, isn't it fascinating? Paul is saying, because remember, Paul was a Pharisee among the Pharisees. He's Sanhedrin, man. He was top dog is what he was. There, wasn't, there weren't many people higher than, than Paul in, in that time, in that situation. And Paul is saying to you, I was separated. I was a separated. I was a Pharisee. But now he's saying, I am separated to the gospel. Ah, I was separated to a religious system. I follow along in a religious system. I was separated unto that religious system. But Paul says now, no, 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 no. I have been grasped. I have been separated. I have been called out of that religious system. And now I am separated unto the gospel. The gospel of who God is, the gospel, what's important, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what he's saying. And listen, was there anybody who had more radical separation than he did? I mean, think about it. Here he is heading off into Damascus to do what? To, br- to carry out murderous threats against the Christians that were in Damascus. He was ready to go do mojo, wasn't he? he like I said, he was the original ISIS. You know what I mean? He's, he's going to town to, to destroy. In fact, it says in the scriptures that there, he, he took pleasure. He took pride in, 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 in causing Christians to blaspheme their God. He took pride in that. This was the man that he was. See, some of you think out there, well, look, no, my past history, Gary, I, I'd rather just sit here and be quiet because I'm no person to be used by God. Well, you consider Saul at that time. You talk about a man that no one, in fact, the early brothers back then in the church, they didn't even believe it. That's how wicked and evil they thought of, of Saul at the time. And yet here he is on his way in. He gets knocked down on the road to Damascus. And by the way, when we go to Israel from the Golan Heights, you can still look down and see the road to Damascus. In fact, way over here, just about here, you can see Damascus right there from way over here. But anyway, yeah, you can see Damascus over there. And you know where Paul was heading to, heading out to, to breathe out, to carry out these threats. God God just radically, he's knocked on his back. He's looking up, man, and he hears, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And what does Saul respond? What does he say to him? Lord, who are you, Lord? Listen, if you're in the boxing ring with Mike Tyson and you look up from your ground and you're all groggy and he's sweating over you and he's got his fist like this, at that moment, he's Lord. You know what I mean? (laughs) He just knocked you down really hard, right? Well, the Lord had just knocked Saul down is what he's done. And he's looking up. He's like, who are you, Lord? But he knew enough to call him Lord. He knew enough to know his position, didn't he? I don't know what it's going to take for some of you to get knocked down on your backs. I don't know what's going to happen in your life. Listen, he'll do what it, he, he will do the thing that it takes to do what? To draw you into him. That's what he did with Saul. Next thing you know, Saul is writing about this glorious, wonderful gospel. I have been separated. I have been separated from the life I used to live to do what? To carry out this message now. Listen, the theme today is carrying out this message. You are, apos- you are an apostle because you have been called to carry out a specific message. Today, we, we honor and we, we look up to missionaries. Missionaries have been called with specific reason, specific message. But in a, in a sort of a strange way, you have the same calling. We're all missionaries to go out into this world and to take the gospel out. So anyway, he, Paul realizes quickly, man, religion is no longer going to satisfy him. The, the, the old way of doing things and the old systems no longer. So then he says in verse two, which he promised before through his prophets. Now listen, what he's going to do now, he's going to take this idea of the gospel. Now we know what the residue of the gospel is. We know what the results of the gospel become, don't we? What's the result of the gospel? People get saved, salvation, right? Salvation comes, but he's going to give us some of the building blocks of the salvation. This is what he's going to say to us. Verse two, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy scripture concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh declared, declared, um, 
the idea of declared there, by the way, is to be marked off, defined by. So if you go out and you, you're going to plant a garden in your backyard, you go out and you start to, 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 to declare it means I'm going to border it off. I'm going to simply make this. As, this is the area that's going to be my garden. That's what it's going to be. That's what he means. And declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So we have five elements here. There are five elements. I was going to say six. Um, that's my education level. But there's five, there's five here is what he says, elements to the gospel. This is not what the gospel is going to do. This is what has created this gospel. Listen to what he says. First of all, it's been fulfilled by prophecy. It's been fulfilled by prophecy. He says through the prophets is exactly what he said to us there. Let me refresh. Which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scripture. Fulfilled in prophecy. Do you realize if you're holding a Bible in your hands today, maybe it's on your tablet or on your phone or whatever it's on, but you have the Bible. Do you realize that you're holding something that is truly remarkable in your hands truly miraculous. There has never been a book, you know, we understand the Bible's a series, 66 books, but you realize there's never been a book that has been placed under more scrutiny through brilliant minds than the Bible for thousands of years. People have done anything and everything that they can to dismantle it, to discourage it, to cause, to cause confusion with it. People have used it in the name of religion to do some of the worst things, the atrocities in the world, and on and on and on. Yet you still have the most incredible book that is sitting on your lap or in your hands that you can possibly imagine. And do you realize, unlike any other book that we'll we'll label it as religious, okay, let's pretend we're walking into the bookstore and you have a section now, religious books, and the Bible's right there along with all the other nonsensical books that are there. Every one of those nonsensical books will call themselves spiritual or religious, yet none of them will do what the Bible does. Do you understand that the Bible puts its neck right above everything else, right in the line of fire, and states prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, on and on and on, hundreds, thousands of the prophetic uttered, everyone either has been brought into fruition, is coming into fruition, or is going to be coming into fruition soon. Every one of them. There's no other religious book in the world that dares. The Koran, uh -uh, not even close. None of these other religious books will dare do what the Bible does. You want to know why? Because the Bible is God's word. And God says, I know the very end from the very beginning. Listen, do you think prophecy is hard? For, do you think God gets out this big, huge, like it looks like Jiffy Pop, you know, hat on his head and sits down and starts to swirl things around, looking into a crystal ball and going, I think I see that you once had a dog and you lived near a road and, oh, well, let's forget that one next. <laughs> That's not what God does. He doesn't predict like God knows what's going on. Why? Because it's all his plan. It's all his happening. So it's not like a big, like he's got to conjure it up. He knows. The Bible is full of these things. The Bible has predicted, did predict the coming of Jesus Christ long before Jesus Christ comes into the world. Long before. And it continues to predict and it continues to tell us what's going to happen. And let me tell you, it ain't because the world has tried not to figure this out. Many people, many people, Voltaire, many others, have tried to dismantle it. Yet they can't because it's God's word. He blesses that word even above his own name. That's the word of God. That's what you have in your lap. Is that pretty remarkable? Think about that next time you just stick it up on the shelf. You know, it's really funny, isn't it? The Ark of the Covenant, that's our mock-up of the Ark. Tommy Torres did a great job. That's our right there, right? Remember the movie? Indiana Jones, remember that? Remember at the end of that movie where they take, they take that ark and we all go, <gasps> if you watch that movie, you're like, the ark of the covenant. Next thing you know, like Washington, D.C. gets pushed into some bureaucratic warehouse. Remember that scene? Yeah. And we all stand appalled. I can't believe they would take the ark of the covenant and just stick it in a warehouse someplace, blah, 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 blah. Which, by the way, it's not. But we all get so indignant about it, yet then we take the Bible, which is a miraculous book, which is, which is, which is amazing, and we just stick it up on a shelf. gets dust covered. That's the Bible. That's God's Word. 
Thanks for joining us today on A Moment of Truth, the radio ministry of Calvary Chapel, Gloucester County. Pastor Gary Clark is our teacher on the program, and he's also the senior pastor at Calvary Chapel, Gloucester County. If you are without a church home, we want to invite you to come and worship with us at Calvary Chapel, Gloucester County. We meet every Sunday for three services at 8, 9.30, and 11.15 a.m., as well as Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Calvary Chapel is located in Whitman Plaza, 5360 Route 42 North in Turnersville, New Jersey. You can find complete directions and more information at cc-gc.org. Again, for more information, go to cc-gc.org or simply call 856-302-1804. If you'd like to listen to this message again or download an MP3 version, visit our website, cc-gc.org. Have a wonderful day in the Lord and join us next time on A Moment of Truth with Pastor Gary Clark. Brought to you by Calvary Chapel, Gloucester County.